Hello everyone, uh, this is Klaus from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Design for Computer Science, Topic 8, Multiple Comparisons. So in this video, we're going to talk... So until now, in the previous videos, we always talked about um, exper uh, ana in statistical analysis where you had two samples that maybe came from the same population, maybe they came from different population, and you want to make a comparison between them. Well, in this video, we're going to talk about a different situation. The situation that we're going to talk about is the following. Uh, imagine that we have multiple samples, more than two, three, four, five samples, and maybe some of those samples came from different populations, Maybe all of the samples come from the same population. And you want to test uh, a hypothesis made based on a parameter of these populations. Where could this happen? Let me give you two examples. One example that is very common is uh, parameter tuning. So parameter tuning is when we want to test multiple settings of a different parameter. For example, uh, let's say that you're testing a neural network and you want to test one of the hyperparameters of the neural network. Should this network, for instance, should this network have two, three, or four layers? So you do one experiment with two layers, one experiment with three layers, and one experiment with four layers. And you want to compare the results. So you have three samples. How do you compare three samples? Okay. Another is a comparison of multiple algorithms. Let's say that you propose a new algorithm for uh, black box optimization. And for the problem that you are studying, there are four algorithms that are the state of art. And you want to compare your algorithm against all these four algorithms. So what do you do? Okay, so in the t-test that we studied last lecture, it can be used for hypotheses about one or two samples. So how do we do with these test cases where we have more than two samples? Think about it for a second before advancing. So, one way that we see many sometimes in the literature, but is a wrong approach, is to do multiple pairwise testing. So, for instance, let's say that we have six methods, A, B, C, D, E. So, in the paper, they will do a series of t-tests. So, they will do a t-test of A against B, a t-test of A against C, a t-test of A against D, a t-test of A against E, etc., etc., etc. What is the problem with that? What is the problem of having this big table with t-tests all over the place? Okay. Well, remember that each time that you do a hypothesis test, this hypothesis test will have a type one error. So when you say, oh, I did my t-test and my p-value was 0.001, uh, that means that you have 0 0.001 chance of having a uh, type 1 error. So when you set your confidence, in, your confidence value of the test to be alpha equal to 0 0.05, it means that even if your test is statistically significant, there is still a 5% chance that the new hypothesis might be true. If you think about how probabilities work, if you have independent events, and you start to repeat them over and over and over and over, uh, the probabilities, they compound by multiplying against each other. Let's see an example. Let's say that you do one test with alpha equal to 0 0.05. If you get, if you reject the new hypothesis, you have a 0 0.05 chance of being wrong, of having a type 1 error, which is what we wanted in the first place. However, if you do two tests, A versus B and A versus C, now there's a chance that the first test is wrong and there's a chance that the second test is wrong. What is the chance that you did not get a type one error? Well, it will be one minus 0 0.95 times 0 0.95. So the chance of not having a type one error when you have two tests is 0 0.09. What if you have six tests? If you have six tests, now your chance is even more compounded. You have one minus 0 
times 0 0.95 times 0 0.95 six times and your compound type 1 error rate is now 0 0.26 so now you have one in four chances of having a type 1 error in your experiment that's getting pretty big what if you have 20 tests if you have 20 tests the chance of a type 1 error becomes 0 0.64 can this happen? Well, actually, it's it's not very hard, okay? There is this, um, I will show you this uh, cartoon, which kind of illustrates the point. And if you don't know XKCD, I highly recommend it. It's very nice. Anyway, so here we have a situation where one person is saying, she's saying, oh, maybe jelly beans cause acne, and they decide to do an experiment to test. So the scientists did an, did an experiment to say, oh, no, no, we did not find any relationship between jelly beans and acne, and the result was statistically significant. Okay, great, let's go back to play some games. Except that she goes, no, no, wait, wait, maybe it's only a certain color, maybe it's only, uh, it's one of the colors that call, cause acne, the others don't cause. So they decide to test all of the colors. So they start to test purple, and then they start brown, and then they start pink, and then they start blue, and then they start teal, salmon, red, turquoise, magenta, tan, cyan, green, lilac, black, peach, orange. They test all of them, except that <clears throat> when they test uh, the green jelly beans, their experimental results gives a p-value of under 0.005. So they found a statistically significant link between green jelly beans and acne. Whoa, right? So you got your paper and you got the news. Green jelly beans cause acne. And you have 95% confidence. Well, can you see the problem here? Okay. It's like you're trying every time you're doing an experiment. And every time you have a chance for this to happen. Okay, so if you keep repeating your experiments over and over and over, there is a small chance that you're gonna get a type one or a type two errors, and you don't want that. Okay, so what can you do? There are specific techniques that we can use to avoid uh, this kind of problems in experiments you involve in multiple comparisons. In this lecture, I will explain one of these techniques, which is using the ANOVA, the analysis of variance. Okay? The ANOVA is a statistical test that detects differences in sets of samples. So we're going to work with a set of sample, and we're going to build a statistical model that will test if in that set of sample, if there is at least one sample inside of that set that is different from the others. In other words, if there is at least one sample from the set that does not come from the same population as the others do. Okay? Uh, after we do the ANOVA, we know that in the set of samples that we are studying, there is at least one that is different, but we don't know which one. So to know which one, we do what is called a post hoc comparison. And we're going to see what is a post-hoc comparison. We're going to see some types of post-hoc comparisons and how we add post-hoc comparisons in our experiment design. Okay? Of course, the, this is not the only way to deal with multiple samples. Uh, it's just one example. And you want to study uh, your particular case to see what would be the best way to deal with multiple observations in the case that you're in the, in the type of experiment that you're trying to do. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so let's start with an example. Okay, so uh, we're gonna examine an example where we have a paper manufacturing operation. And in this paper manufacturing operation, we want to know which material is the best material to use for paper, for paper production. So let's say that we are interested in creating paper that has the highest possible tensile strength. In other words, tensile strength is the, uh, the ability of the paper of not getting sheared up. And that's very important for industrial paper. Okay? So 
Of course, paper is made of wood, so it makes sense to imagine that depending on the type of wood, uh, the, tensi the tensile strength might change. So we're going to test several different woods and we're going to try to figure out if any of these woods is superior to the others based on the tensile strength. Okay? So in this case, we were using a pilot plant, which means that we're using a special factory that is going to be used just for this experiment. Okay? So, let's say that we have a limited budget to do this. We don't have unlimited, uh, we don't have unlimited resources. So we, we are limited in the number of experiments that we can do. So for each kind of paper, for each kind of wood that we are going to test, we can only create six observations. We can only create six, um, six packages. So we generate six packages of paper for each type of wood. We calculate the average tensile strength for each of the six packages of paper, and we use that as our four samples, okay? So with these assumptions, we say that our experiment has one factor, okay, wood fiber. So this is what changes in our experiment, the type of wood. It's the same factory, same number of samples. We have one thing that changes, that is the type of wood that is used as material for the paper. And we have four levels, okay? Because we have four types of wood. Wood type A, wood type B, wood type C, and wood type D. Now, for each of these four levels, we have six replicates. So we have six observations for each kind of, of level. Six observations of A, six observations of B, six observations of C, etc. Now, the response variable will be the tensile strength of the paper. So this is the variable that we are interested. And uh, for instance, let's say that it's measured in kilo PA. And the team wants to know if any fiber type would lead to an increase of the mean TS value of the paper. So of course there is a variance in the production, but we want to know if on average is any of the, the types, of, types of wood better for guaranteeing a high PA. Now, like we said before, it's important that we want to know not only if the average is better, but we want to have a minimum effect of significance. So for this experiment, we're saying that the minimum difference that makes sense is five kilo PA. Any difference below that is too small to, to really matter. We just buy both types of paper and the differences are very small, okay? Now, uh, the upper estimate for the standard deviation of this process is six kilo PA and the desired error levels are 0 0.1 for alpha, so we have a confidence of 90% and 0 0.2 for beta, so we have a power of 80%. So <clears throat> it's good when we do the experiment, so we collect the data, we go for it for the factory, we produce six, um, six sets of paper from each type of wood, we randomize the production order and we collect the data. So the, good, the idea is that first, before we do the analysis, we take a quick look at the data. So one way to do that is to draw the box plot of the six uh, plants. So we have here one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we are interested in seeing, so for looking at this, it looks like there is a difference, okay? It looks like there is a difference uh, between the different papers. We also observe, okay, that there is, a, there is a small variance and we can see that paper type B has somewhat bigger variance, but it's not too much bigger than the others. So we're gonna do a test for this later, but it looks like for each type of paper, they have about reasonably similar um, vari variability. We also see that type C has one outlier here. This might come important. This might become important later. Maybe not. Okay. So now that we have the data, what is the statistical model that we're going to use? Remember that we built a statistical model in the last lecture. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to build a statistical model for our uh, for our situation. Now remember that we have six observations of four types of paper. So we have twenty-four observations, 
And these observations, the value of these observations can be represented as yij. What is iyj? Well, we have the means model, which means that the yi, the value y of the observation i, is based on the mean i, okay, plus the error ij. Now, i changes according to the paper. So i goes from 1 to 4, paper 1, paper 2, paper 3, paper 4. And j changes according to the repetition. So we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So when we say that the value of the output of paper i, repetition j, it's equal to the mean of paper i, and maybe these means are the same, we don't know yet, we are still thinking about how we're gonna model this, plus the error of that repetition, error of paper i, repetition j. We can break this down, this is the means model, we can break this down as the effect model. So now, the value of IHA is the grand mean, is the general mean of the process, plus a, 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 a change based on the type of the paper. So the, pa the type of the paper will increase or decrease the mean of the process, plus our error that is based for every repetition. So this would be the random error, this would be the influence of the paper type, and this would be the grand mean of the process, okay? So U is the overall mean, TI is the effect of the ith level, and EIJ is the residual, the error, okay? Now, uh, in the, to think about the statistical tests, so we use the effects model, so we're gonna use this effects model, and we're gonna make some assumptions, okay, for the ANOVA. So we're gonna, so we're using the effect model, we say that yij is the great mean plus the effect of paper i plus the, air, the residual of paper i repetition j, okay? So we have a levels and then repetitions. And we're gonna say that this error is independently distributed, okay? Like we said before, independent and identically distributed. And it's distributed following a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma. So we're gonna say that the residuals of the production, they follow a normal distribution, which is equivalent of the assumption of normality that we did on the last few classes. So a way to visualize the, uh, the effects model that we described here is this. So we have the grand mean here, okay? And we have variation on the grand mean based on the effect. So this is the variation for paper one, this is the variation for paper two, this is the variation for paper three, this is the variation for paper four. And for each variation, we have some variation within the same paper type from the, uh, from the variance of the process itself. Okay, so now what we do? This is, will be very similar. So if you understood the lecture of unpaired uh, testing, this is very similar. So we are interested to see if any of the papers has an effect, if any of the paper types, if any of the materials has an influence on the mean, which means that we want to know if this Ti is different than zero for any type of paper. If Ti is zero for paper type I, this means that the mean of the paper is equal to the grand mean. But if Ti is different than zero for the paper type I. This means that paper type I has an effect that changes the mean of the process to the mean of that paper type. And this, this effect can be positive or negative. So we have two hypotheses. Hypothesis zero, the new hypothesis is that Ti is zero, so the effect is zero for every I in the number of factors, one, two, three, four. The alternate hypothesis is that there exists at least one Ti that is different from zero. So look here, our new hypothesis is that all the Ti's are zero, and our alternate hypothesis is that at least one Ti is not zero. At least one Ti has an effect. At least one type of paper causes the mean of the population to change from this normal mean of the process. So this is the normal mean of the process. This is the mean of one type of paper that has a TI that is different from zero, okay? 
Now, if the data collection is done in a random order with constant experimental conditions, we describe this as a completely randomized design. So if you see, oh, this is a randomized design, this is what we're talking about. We have one factor, we change this factor, and we sample this factor from the system in a random order, and we expect that besides the factor that we are measuring, all the other effects don't have a big, uh, a big influence on the results. Okay, <clears throat> so this approach to modeling the mean effects is also known as the fixed effect models. And we're gonna talk about the mathematics of the fixed effect models uh, a little bit, okay? So this will allow us to test a hypothesis in a situation where the factor levels are defined by the experimenter. So the inference will be done, we're gonna do inference over the mean values of each level. So for each level, we're gonna calculate the mean, and we are going to do the inference on this. One thing that is important to know is that for this statistical test, for this statistical modeling, we cannot extend the results of this modeling for other levels. For instance, let's say that we have four levels, one, two, three, four for a parameter, and we do this analysis. This analysis will only be effective for one, two, three, four. It does not include level five that we do not test. This is because this, this, um, this analysis will be based on, on the interaction between these factors. If you add level five later, the interaction of level five with the other levels may change the result, okay? So if you, want, you cannot generalize the results of these uh, fixed effect models to other effects that you did not predict, that you did not add in the experiment, okay? There are ways to deal with that, mixed effect models, uh, but we're not going to see them in this class. Okay, so let's go back to the analysis. So we're going to use the effects model, the fixed effects model, to describe the statistical test. And remember, our new hypothesis was that uh, all Ti are zero. So the sum of Ti for Ti1 to A will be zero. That's our new hypothesis. T1 is zero, T2 is zero, T3 is zero, T4 is zero. Now, uh, if we think about the variability of the data, the total variability of the data, we can describe the total variability of the data as the sum of squares, okay? And what is the sum of squares? It's like we have the data for factor I, uh, observation J, and we can, see, we can subtract that from the, the uh, overall sample mean. So y bar is the, sample, is the mean of the entire sample from all the observations. Now, if we square this difference, this is the squared uh, deviation. And when we sum this over all a and all n, we have SST, which is the squared deviation, okay, of our, of our population. Now, if we break down the sum, we can divide our SST into two components. Component one is the levels. So this is the error of the levels. And component two, this is the error of the repetitions. Okay, so this is the variability of, that is, this is the part of the vari variability that is due to the difference in levels. And this is the part of the variability that is due to the uh, arbitrary errors. <clears throat> so uh, if we divide the sum of squares by the degrees of freedoms, we're gonna have something called the mean square, okay? Remember that the degree of freedom is the number of data that we got. So we're basically dividing the squared residuals by the number of samples, and that will be the MSE, okay? So we have the mean square error, which is the sum of square errors divided by the number of uh, levels times the number of repetitions. Now, if we, we can generalize this for the mean square errors of the levels, and the mean square error of each level is the square error of each level divided by uh, the number of levels. The expected, the expected value for this is that the expected value for the mean square error is 
the sigma is the uh, <clears throat> the variance of the population, and the square the expected value for the mean square error of each level is the sigma plus this factor that is the influence, the part of the variance that is because of the influence of the the the, the, the parameter tau. Okay, so we have two expected values here. We have the mean square error, that is alpha sigma g square, and we have the mean square for the levels, that is sigma square plus this value. Okay? Uh, now, you notice that here we have an unbiased estimator. Okay? The estimator can error for more or for minus, but it does not have a tendency to, 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 error, for, to error more for one side or the other. On the other hand, this error here, it's biased because it's biased by the size of the squared, uh, the, the, the error part that is responsible by tau. So the more that tau i, the more that one of the factors influence the results, these expected mean square levels will be bigger. Okay? So now this says that if we have an influence of the factors, uh, the, the, the expected values of mean square levels will be different, will be bigger than square level, the square value of uh, the mean standard, uh, the mean squared error. However, if one of the tau's is different from zero, we're gonna have this extra factor that will increase the value of sigma square. So what this means is that if the new hypothesis is true, the mean square error is equal to the mean square of the levels, which is equal to sigma square. This is because all ti is zero. That was our new hypothesis. If the new hypothesis is not true, this sum is not zero, and this equality will not hold. So I guess you can see that to test for the ANOVA, we are going to test for the equality of these two errors. So even though we're going to say something about the means of the samples, the test will be done on the squared errors, on the variability of the samples. Okay, I find this to be a very interesting point. So, uh, we're going to define an F statistic. And F0 is the square, level, the square error, the mean square of the levels divided by the mean square error. Okay? And this F statistic will be distributed according to a F distribution. So, there's an F distribution that will... Um, <clears throat> will describe the distribution of this fraction, okay? So we can define the degrees of freedom of F, and just like in the T test or the Z test, we calculate a, a percentage of the cumulative distribution function that will fall, will fill, um, <clears throat> will fill a value equivalent to the interested um, um, confidence value for the test, okay? So we calculate the percentile of FAAN and we compare that with the value of F0 to choose our critical region, okay? So the end of the test is the same. The part that changes is the middle. We choose what is the statistic that we want, it's statistic F0. We choose what is the threshold values that we want, and it's this, um, <clears throat> it is this F A minus one, F A minus one, okay? And in this case, if the new hypothesis is false, then this value, the MS level, will be much bigger than MSE, okay? And then we're gonna have larger values of F0. If not, if F, F X X0 is true, then these two values will be very close to each other and F0 will be close to one. So in the paper manufacturing, let's see an example. So we can run this in R using the AOF function. So the AOV function, we calculate uh, TS of KPA explained by fiber type for the paper data. So we get two variables from the same paper and we calculate an AOV of one based on the other. Okay, so we can get here the values. So for fiber type, we have three degrees of freedom. That's because we have four fiber types. Uh, for residuals, we have 20 degrees of freedom. That's because we have four fiber types and one uh, individual, so 24 minus four. 
And here we have the, mean, the sum of squares. And here we have the mean square. And we can see here that the mean square is much smaller than the sum of squares, like it's three times smaller. And here it's 25 times smaller. So for this value here, the f value will be 13.42. For this value here, the f value would be much, much, much lower. Okay? So the ANOVA table, this is, the, this is called the ANOVA table. And the ANOVA table will give us information of the source of variation together with the corresponding values. Okay? So in this case, this ANOVA test rejected the new hypothesis that all the effects are zero. But what does this mean? We want to know which one is the best. And all that we know right now is that the new hypothesis that all effects are zero is not true. So what is the situation that we have? Okay. So I'm going to pause uh, the video a little bit and I will continue uh, the discussion on the next video. See you there.